You've decided you're ready to become a parent, and suddenly you're overwhelmed with people who feel they have the right to inform you on the correct way to conceive, give birth, what fears you should have, and the proper way to parent. How do you filter through the opinions? How do you know what's trustworthy information and what's a myth or just plain outdated? Welcome to the Birth Ease Podcast. Join your host, Michelle Smith, and her guests as they cut through the noise and fear by sharing valuable tips, tools, and proven methods that help you connect with your own inner wisdom as you navigate the sacred journey that is pregnancy, birth, and parenthood in a more relaxed and confident manner. This podcast does not constitute, nor is it intended, as medical advice. Hello, Birthies families. Welcome to this heartfelt space. I'm your host, Michelle Smith. In the last several episodes, I have been discussing a heavier and a deeper, but very, very important topic, that of trauma within birth. And in this episode, I'm so excited to have back with me, Susan DeCinci. Susan DeCinci is a licensed psychotherapist, life and business coach, author, speaker, podcast host, and the health and fitness category director for Podcast Magazine. She has invested the last 27 years guiding her clients in recognizing how their past negative conditioning creates their present and future and stops them from stepping into their infinite possibilities. As a highly regarded human behavior and emotions expert, also known as the Possibilities Curator, She co-authored an Amazon-ranked number one international best-selling book alongside Neil Donald Walsh and Marcy Shimoff with her own book set to release late 2020. Susan's brilliance as a trauma expert really shines in our conversation. It is my sincerest wish that you gain as much insight and value in our conversation as I did. Due to just the nature of the topic and the length of the interview, it will be divided into two separate episodes, one that will play this week and one the following week. And if at any time as you're listening to the interview, you find yourself feeling triggered or overwhelmed by the nature of the conversation, please pause the podcast. You can always return back to it later if you choose to. And just take a moment to take a few deep, slow breaths, get up, walk around, perhaps go outside in nature. You can wash your face, your hands. And of course, if you need to reach out to a friend, your midwife, your physician, therapist, or you can always reach out to Susan or me. You can find the links to reach out to us in the podcast show notes. Welcome, Susan, to the Birthies Podcast. I am so incredibly grateful and honored to have you here with me today. Oh, thank you so much, Michelle, for having me. I am so honored to be here. I just really loved our episode on your show, Kick Your Butts, and we talked about the ways in which trauma can begin in pregnancy or in birth. I want to explore how trauma can impact us and what trauma is and the ways that we can begin to resolve trauma and create post-traumatic growth. And so before we dive into that, could you please share what brought you to your work and your expertise in trauma? Absolutely. It is such a loaded topic. And I'd first like to say Our episode that we did on my show was just absolutely fantastic and is one of my highest downloaded and listened to episodes. So thank you, Michelle, for that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So I came into the trauma space because I myself personally have been a six-time sexual assault survivor. Oh my gosh. And for many years, I was barely existing. I I believed I was surviving and I truly wasn't even existing. Although on the outside, I appeared to be this very upbeat and inspirational and happy and optimistic person inside. Even though 
my family and friends and even the police and people around me throughout these instances knew what had occurred. So it wasn't like it was a secret. There was this incredible darkness inside that I truly felt worthless. And I truly felt like I was incapable of really offering value to those around me. And so although people would say things like, wow, there's something about you and, or your energy, or you're so inspirational, or you're so wise or happy or a great friend or whatever it might have been, there was this inner belief that I was worthless and really didn't bring any value to the world. And so it wasn't until the last assault happened when I was 28 and it was very violent and uh, I, I really believed I was going to die that night. And I didn't, obviously. But I was married at the time to a very verbally and emotionally abusive alcoholic. And he made a comment a couple of weeks after the last assault. And my son was just shy of two years old when the assault occurred. And so this was just after his second birthday. And he said something that cut me to the core. And I literally sat down and wrote my son a suicide note. And although I can't be 100% clear on whether or not I would have actually gone forward with making an attempt on my life, I knew that I felt that certain. And I wrote this note, and what stopped me was rereading that note and recalling a childhood vision of me standing in front of the mirror at four years old, knowing that anything was possible. So it was in that moment I made this decision to really tap into the deepest part of my strength and awareness. And I put the letter away. I committed to believing it. And that led me on a journey of finding therapists and coaches and mentors and other people in my circle that could really help me learn how to not just survive, but begin to thrive. And then because of that, I knew that my experiences, while at the time I didn't know they were gifts, and I know that that's very controversial to say that, especially around trauma. Right. I truly believe there's gift in every experience that we have, whether we perceive it to be positive or negative. And so I knew that if I was going to really thrive and really step into my life the way I had made that decision to do that night by putting the letter away, I knew that I had to find and not manufacture some out of you know falsehood, but really find the gifts and the growth in the trauma itself. And once I was able to do that, I knew that my calling was to really continue to share my experiences and my work as a therapist and coach with others who have experienced what I call big T traumas, like what I experienced, or like a natural disaster or a car accident, you know, the things we often think of as trauma, and also what I would call the little T traumas that are kind of born from the big T traumas, or even some of our past and our upbringing that then can create a whole host of issues and feelings of worthlessness and no value and something we call the imposter syndrome, right? Where you feel like a fraud. Right. And so that's really how I kind of came into the work. It was truly born from my own experiences and my need to not just survive, but learn to thrive. And also knowing that I needed to give back because there's just so many of us who have experienced the big T traumas that if we don't learn to walk with it, we'll be consumed by it. Right, right. So thank you for sharing that, that story and sharing so honestly in it. And as someone who has also survived, I don't know if I really like that word, anymore but I've, I know right yeah right but I've experienced trauma 
and how it can shape us, but we can also create that resiliency from it. Mm -hmm. So would you mind sharing what trauma is? What is big T trauma? What is small T trauma? I'm a little different and I hope that your listeners will, you know, receive what I'm saying with an understanding that my primary driver throughout my life, even as a child, and even going through experiences such as these, as well as the typical childhood things and adult and young adult things we all go through that may create challenge or problem, or I'll explain a little more of the little T trauma pieces in a minute, but please receive it from this place of, I've always seen the soul of people. I've always been able to see the heart of people. And that's one of my deepest gifts. And now that what's the popular term, my superpower. Right. And so I come to trauma then from a bit of a different lens. And so how I've always seen it as a therapist over the last 23 years is that trauma is truly anything that is shocking to the system. That's my very blanket kind of broad definition of trauma. So an example, I'm 12 years old and I lose my cat, needs to be euthanized, unfortunately, and my parents wouldn't let me go in to bear witness to that. We had two cats, a husband and wife, that were euthanized together, Mm -hmm. and the male cat was my baby. He followed me everywhere, slept with me. You know, he was, he was my little best friend, right? And because my parents wouldn't let me go in because they felt it would be too traumatic for me, I actually found that to be more traumatic. So that is actually something I would call little t trauma. And again, I'll be a little more specific here in a moment. But what I recognized was that trauma is anything that is shocking to our system and that we then have a difficult time either making sense of, understanding, or receiving the experience as something that we can manage and handle. And so it becomes kind of this loop that happens in our mind where we pick apart every piece of it And we often insert self-blame into it. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I really, really appreciate that definition. Yeah. And so that's what I would call trauma overall. And then I break it down a little bit more and I look at it as what I've alluded to as these big T traumas and little T traumas. And the big T traumas, again, are the things that I think many of us are conditioned to automatically think of when we hear trauma, such as sexual assault or abuse, whether as a child or an adult, domestic violence, whether you're the perpetrator or the the recipient of the violence, uh, car accidents, natural disasters, fires, floods, things like that that are these very dramatic and very traumatic experiences. And they breed a whole host of additional experiences that come from being a survivor. And I, like you, am not favored of that word. But for lack of a better word, you know, I still use survivor. I'm not sure what word to put in place of that. Um, Thriver, that I'm thriving. Thriving, but you know, it takes a while to get to that thriving place. It does. Like I said, I thought I was surviving and I recognized that I was even, I wasn't even barely existing. Right. You know, so there is this kind of, I won't say a linear step because life is too fluid and humans are too amazing and beautiful and fluid. And so there is no linear fashion in that way. But There is definitely a process that must happen over whatever periods of time for each individual that go from that barely existing place 
to surviving to thriving and even beyond thriving actually. And so then I would look at the little T traumas and those are things like me losing my cat when I was 12 or maybe it would be a divorce or it could be that you moved five times as a child or an adult and you had to leave a circle of friends or a school that you loved or a community that you were involved in and you were the new person or the new child or the new young adult or adult in that community getting fired from a job. And then one step below that even, a little deeper into the little t trauma, are the things that we often don't even consciously realize are traumatic for us that may have happened through our caregivers and the experiences we have when we're giving birth. Right. And the ways that maybe our parents spoke to us or our teachers spoke to us when we were children or young adults or even again as an adult and how we don't see those things as any kind of real trauma per se, but it's very traumatic and it really affects how we see ourselves and how we think about ourselves in the world around us. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I feel like those smaller traumas can, they can compound each other and they all, our subconscious stores them together. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's really kind of why, unfortunately, my field as, you know, therapy is in business sad to say, is that, yes, you have people who have serious mental illness and things that are biochemically and biophysiologically going askew in their brain and their body. And then you have pretty much everybody else. And that pretty much everybody else, sometimes it is solely based on the things that are subconscious in play that are affecting their biochemicals and their biophysiological, like the neurology in the brain, right? The structures of the brain and even in the body. And we store these things from an energetic perspective in the body that can come out in a variety of ways, days, weeks, months, years, decades later. So absolutely it's a, Oftentimes, the little t traumas are the, the bigger culprits of various different behaviors that we experience or have or engage in that we don't understand. And, and if we don't understand it, how can we expect those around us who love us to understand it? And we may not even be able to explain it. Right. We just know we react a certain way. And people might say, what's wrong with you? Why are you reacting like that? And we're like, I don't know. I just don't like this or this or that. And we can't even explain it because it's being driven by those subconscious little T trauma experiences. So yes, right. That often we tend to react instead of respond and we're not even aware of why we do that until we go in and heal whatever is there within our subconscious i feel like our subconscious is our protector it wants to keep us safe it wants to make sure that we feel loved accepted capable those basic human needs and so often we get that programming mm -hmm. that wants to keep us safe or wants to make us feel capable. And it may have served us really well when we were younger or in a different situation. But as we get older, it's not serving us anymore. But that programming still there. Absolutely, exactly. And that's the whole foundation and basis of my life's work is to whether someone has experienced trauma on any level, I mean, I don't walk around with my clients and diagnose or label big T, little t trauma. I'm aware, though, the things that are in play because our mind is the protector. Our mind is the sentry and the guard. And that is its sole job 
is to protect us and keep us safe. And it is the discerner of all the incoming data. So if we've now experienced trauma on any level, again, I shared the big T and little t trauma just for kind of an understanding and a differentiation, but the truth is trauma is trauma. And so if we have experienced trauma, which unfortunately we all have on one level or another, those pieces are going to be in play because now our mind is going to be filtering everything through that lens. And sometimes, like you said, we're aware of it and we can maybe kind of step in as this conscious observer and maybe respond then versus react. More often though, we react and we don't understand the reaction. And a lot of times, many around us don't understand the reaction and now you add a different layer of additional trauma because they're sitting in a judgment or a criticism because they don't understand why you just reacted the way you did to this seemingly insignificant or small thing. And yet you can't deny what you feel. And I'd love to share with you in relation to having babies. Yes, please. Because I remember, although. The last assault for me didn't happen until my son was already almost two. The fact that I had experienced five other instances prior to the birth of my son, I remember giving birth to him and feeling, knowing first, intellectually, and from a beautiful place, that I'm about to bring forth this beautiful being into the world. And so knowing that this is a beautiful experience and it's one of love and of tenderness, there was that traumatic survivor in me. Even though I had worked through a lot of issues at that point already, but the last, you know, the last assault hadn't happened. So there was a whole other cascade of things to come down the road. I felt like I had worked through a lot and yet I'm laying there on the bed my feet up in the stirrups, and I'm in labor, ready to birth this beautiful being. And part of me could only think about the fact that I felt helpless. I felt disconnected in a way because here I am in this semi-naked fashion with my legs up in the stirrups and the person at the end of the bed who is someone I admired and liked as my doctor but he was male and I'm thinking he's staring at my vagina right and I'm feeling helpless right and exposed and so I had these strange mixed thoughts and feelings although a bit fleeting for me because I had worked a lot on some of my trauma experiences I still had some of those feelings and I didn't really know how to reconcile that because I'm, I'm torn, right? I'm giving birth to this beautiful being. And at the same time, I'm like, I just wanted to close my legs and run away and go, can you push him back in and somehow I'll let him come out naturally or something? You know, a very irrational thought. Right. But it's a common one women can have. I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to go home. I want to escape this. And the whole fight, flight, or freeze can come into play during labor as well. And very often, women freeze because we are so vulnerable. And I think having attended hundreds and hundreds of births, that our system is it really set up to honor the fact? What is the statistic? One in four women have experienced some kind of sexual assault or trauma. Is that right? Yeah, I believe it's actually more than that, unfortunately, now. But the last more official statistic I had seen was one in four. One in four, right. And just the very nature of the hospital can be triggering for women. And Mm -hmm. I often talk with clients about the very way that it's set up when it's time to give birth, we are in those stirrups, just like you were talking about, and there's a bright light shining on our lady parts. 
And Mm -hmm. often people are yelling, one, two, three, push, push, push. That's it. Get mad. Get mad at your baby and push. (laughs) <laughs> and God, oh my gosh. I know, and I, um, I understand it's a paradigm and some people like cheerleader type coaching, but for someone like me with a history of trauma, you're just going to shut me down mm-hmm. completely. And the first place that tightens in our bodies as human beings, when we're afraid is our pelvic floor. So we're shutting down in this trauma. And I think it's important that caregivers begin to think about how their actions can impact women in labor. Mm -hmm. And we need to ask permission. May I touch you? I'd like to do a vaginal exam so we could check your progress. Is that okay with you? (laughs) You Some kind of permission right and to not just touch people without asking right exactly like i'm coming in now and i'm it's i'm going to do a vaginal exam now or i'm going to be doing this as opposed to is this okay mm-hmm. i you know i need to do this is this all right that i do this right now with you and may i proceed is so much more honoring and it gives a sense of control back to the person Right. 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 As opposed, and I think that cuts across not just in giving birth and say being a woman and working with maybe male doctors or female doctors or nurses or midwives or doulas. It doesn't matter who the professional is. It's just an, I think, across all lines, if we are in any kind of disrobed or partially disrobed state, for any kind of a medical check of even just a doctor visit. I know that I always appreciate when I have had professionals who have done just what you've said and asked me and said, you know, I need to do this now, or I would like to do this now. Is this okay? And may I, as opposed to just doing it, because then I don't feel so violated and I feel I have an assemblance of control to say, yeah, but can you give me like 30 seconds? Right. When I was the midwifery birth assistant, and I also worked in the lab at a birth center here in Central Florida years ago, the midwives there, when we had a new patient or client come in, we often referred to our patients as clients, which again, Mm -hmm. it gives you more autonomy. Sure. But when they came in, we would have clients in the exam room and we would have them leave their clothing on until they met the midwife, especially if they hadn't met her before. And they had a conversation about what the exam was going to entail and you got to know the midwife. And then the midwife would say, we're going to do the exam now if you're comfortable. And then the midwife would leave and then the woman would undress. Oh, I love that. And then she, yes. And then she would come back in instead of sitting there in your little paper gown where we tried to use fabric ones because it's less, I don't know, the paper just feels even more vulnerable than cloth, I think. Well, and it feels colder too. And I don't mean temperature, just like Sterile. Yeah, and insignificant. I don't know. There's yes, a, that's yeah. a good word. Insignificant. Yes, and you're so vulnerable. And what other times in our life, if one of my midwife friends uses the example, if you were going to go buy a car and you go into the office, you're not sitting there in the office to do the financial arrangements, having never met this person, wearing nothing but a paper gown. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so true. Right. And I th- yeah. I thought that was so powerful. That is. And I laughed because it's it's so true. And yet we I guess in the medical world, it's you're right. It's the only place that we we do that where we don't really honor or take into account the nature of whatever the relationship might be 
and then meet ahead of time or allow that person to feel comfortable or explain, you know, what you're going to do or ask permission. It's like, I come in, I'm the doctor, you're the patient, you have been disrobed, I have a job to do, and then I need to move on to the next, you know, I need to figure out what's going on here, and then I need to move on to the next patient, in and out, in and out, in and out. And yet, in the medical world, especially, oh my gosh, when you're giving birth, you are in your most open, naked, vulnerable, raw self. Yes, yes. It's one of the most powerful yet vulnerable times in our lives when we're giving birth. Mm -hmm. And I love what Robin Lim, the midwife, says that if someone were to place their fingers into a woman's vagina without asking permission, mm. in any other context, that would constitute rape. Yep. But when we're giving birth and someone says, I'm going to check you now, without asking permission, it's not viewed that way. It's just viewed as routine care. And it's such a complicated subject, I think, but we're so conditioned to just do whatever our caregivers say. And I'm not saying that all medical caregivers act inappropriately, but we do really need to stop and treat women potentially as if they may have experienced some kind of trauma yeah. or assault. Yeah. And that very atmosphere can trigger someone. Well, and I think too, that's such a great point, Michelle. I, I think, you know, in addition to that, that we also have to look at, even if they haven't been through an assault or an abuse of a sexual nature ever, that we don't know each person and their history. And that person may have experienced a lot of other kinds of traumas throughout their life that make them feel as though life in some respects is very unsafe or that they're very out of control or that they need to. And again, a lot of this can go to a very unhealthy side too. But if I've experienced a lot of trauma growing up in the sense of it's the little T trauma, I have these doubts about myself, I'm a bit shy and I'm a bit afraid to be vulnerable and I go to a doctor for the very first time, not even as a woman, let's say, to an OBGYN, but just to a doctor. And the nurse tells me to disrobe and the doctor will be right in. And just like you said before, I have not met the doctor. And then the doctor comes in and he's taking down part of my gown to check my heart and lungs with the stethoscope and part of my breasts are exposed. And I'm not used to ever feeling you know, to being disrobed in front of anybody before, especially someone I don't know, maybe. How incredibly traumatic can that be? I know someone that I actually interviewed on my podcast, who's a dear friend, who, although she's older and had exams before and has children, obviously, that is so not her norm that when she had a heart attack, and she mm. is on the bed, and she had had a heart, ache two, a heart attack two days prior. So she was dealing with the effects of this heart attack for two days and was kind of currently in that heart attack phase, but it wasn't really stopping her at that point. It was a particular kind of heart attack she had. And when she went to her doctor, who did just a normal EKG, I guess, and they were like, oh, you're having a heart attack. We need to get you to the hospital kind of deal. And then all of a sudden, all these doctors come in and all these interns come in and she's disrobed and they're checking this and that and they're all around her in this kind of frenetic state. And she said it was the most terrifying, traumatic thing she'd ever experienced because she felt totally helpless, totally out of control, totally exposed, totally vulnerable, and she has no idea what's really going on. But all these doctors are kind of coming at her. and. I can only imagine, well, I know again from my own experience, but I can only imagine that if a mom is giving birth, 
regardless of who else is there and there's issues and it becomes a bit more of a, a frenzied state then to either save mom or, or baby. Like all of these experiences can be so traumatic and yet no one gives us tools on how to manage them. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Or women, they give birth and their babies are in the NICU. Mm -hmm. The medical community, they're starting to acknowledge that women can incur, families can incur post-traumatic stress oh, yeah. from having a baby in the NICU. Yeah. Women can experience post-traumatic stress from the experience of their birth. Oh, yeah. And especially, especially if things... Sometimes there's just not time because it is a true emergency. But often I think in that space, because it's so routine for caregivers, they forget to stop and just explain, this is what's going on. This is what needs to happen. And if there is a little more time, just to let the patient process that. Because I found in my work what tends to cause birth trauma for a mom in her labor and in the birth of her baby is when she doesn't feel listened to, her needs aren't acknowledged, when she doesn't feel heard. Mm, Does mm -hmm. that make sense? A hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. And the interesting thing, Michelle, is that that's pretty much all of us, whether we're women or men or we're having babies. So now magnify that then even more when you're in that very exposed, raw, vulnerable state that is supposed to be one of the most precious, gentle, and beautiful experiences of your life. And you're bringing the soul into the world. And then you add on top of that these very potentially traumatic pieces. You know, because all of us want to be seen and heard and feel a semblance of control and power as far as, okay, I may know that this situation is not ideal and I know I'm safe and I know that ultimately everything is fine and okay, step by step, we're going to take care of whatever this issue or problem is. But when you have a situation then whether it's an absolute emergency or it just becomes a bit more of a frenzied state, especially like in, with the birth of a child, all that can go out the window and we forget, like you said, that here's this mom and the family. Right. It's not just the mom, it's the family. I've sometimes had clients through the years where the person who experienced the trauma yeah, they had, you know, stress and they had issues related to it, but it was actually some of their family. Yes, yes. That was having a harder time and and kind of dealing with a bit of the post traumatic stress of it more so than the person themselves sometimes. Thank you so much for listening. And please join me next week for the remainder of this truly informative and even transformational interview with Susan. And if you find value in the show, please share it with a friend, rate, subscribe, review, because it helps to get the message out to more families. I truly appreciate it. For more great conversations like these, or to find out more information and access Michelle's library of amazing guests, go to birthdeeservices.com forward slash podcast. For more information on the Birthdees Method, Michelle's classes, meditations, and other services, go to birthdeeservices.com. <laughs>